Quantum mechanical systems with many particles in them are very difficult to solve in principle. Imagine trying to write down the wave function for a system of 10 to the 23rd not quite independent particles. That would be very, very complicated. And under most circumstances, the best that we can hope for is to uncover the general structure of the solution. What sort of energies are going to be allowed, for example. What we're getting into now is the basics of the quantum mechanical structure of solids, which is of course an incredibly rich subject, being, as it is, essentially the basis for all of material science, all of semiconductor physics. One aspect of the theory of solids that we can actually do reasonably accurately, at least from a qualitative perspective, is the behavior of free electrons in conductors, and that's the topic of this lecture. Free electrons in a conductor are something that we can work with reasonably well, because if we think about a chunk of material, for instance, as being the space over which some electron, a conduction electron, is free to wander, the particles are essentially free. The electrons, however, will never be found outside the box, or outside the material. It's very unlikely for an electron to wander off into the air surrounding a chunk of conductor. Conductors just don't do that. So the particles are not found outside the box. The electrons are confined. You can probably see what I'm getting at here. We have free particles that are never going to be found outside of some rectangular region. This is starting to look like the particle in a box. So maybe we can work with that. What about a particle in a box? Well, a single particle in a box, that's easy enough to handle. But what about multiple particles in a box? What if I have a second particle here that's also wandering around on its own? Well, provided I make the very, very inaccurate yet useful assumption that these particles don't interact much, I can actually work with that. Now I'll put a star on that, sort of a footnote asterisk, because this is not a very good assumption that the electrons in a metal don't interact. Essentially what this assumption amounts to is that on average particles aren't going to interact much. Two randomly chosen electrons in a metal are unlikely to have just recently collided, for example, and that, on average, the vast sea of electrons that are not free to move about this equalize the charges to the degree that any two conduction electrons are unlikely to encounter the, the free charges of either the nucleus, free charges of the other electrons, or free charges of other conduction electrons. Those are some pretty stiff assumptions, and they're probably not correct. But if we make those assumptions, we can actually solve this problem and figure out what the quantum mechanical structure is. That's a very useful thing to do, so we're going to go ahead and do it. The starting point, though, is a single particle in a box. The single particle in a box in three dimensions is something that we've talked about, and the Hamiltonian that we're working with is essentially just given by the momentum squared, the kinetic energy, h bar squared over 2m times the gradient operator in three dimensions. We also have to multiply by a potential, which is now going to be a function of x, y, and z, where the potential we're working with, v of x, y, and z now, is equal to, well, zero if we're inside the box, and that's going to happen for x, y, and z in between, let's say, l sub x, l sub y, and l sub z, and zero, respectively. So if x is between zero and lx, y is between zero and ly, and z is between zero and lz, the particle is officially in the box, and the potential energy function is zero. We say the potential energy is infinity outside the box to enforce the particle to always be inside the box. This is essentially identical to our one-dimensional particle in a box, we just have more dimensions to work with, and the solution procedure is very similar. The Schrodinger equation we're working with is, as usual, the time-independent Schrodinger equation, h psi equals e psi, and if we make our usual separation of variables assumption that psi is given by some function of x multiplied by some function of y multiplied by some function of z, what you end up with is three separate, independent, one-dimensional particles in a box. Infinite square well potentials, essentially. One in the x direction, one in the y direction, and one in the z direction. The overall energy of your combination, after you've done separation of variables, is given by essentially the energy contributed by the x, and the energy contributed by the y, and the energy contributed by the z, independent 
one-dimensional particles in a box. The wave functions that you get, psi of x, y, and z, are products, then, of one dimension, three one-dimensional particles in a box. The normalization you get is 8 divided by lx, ly, lz in a square root sign, and then you have your sine functions, as usual, for the 1d particle in a box. Sine of nx pi x over lx, where the quantum number that you get as a result of the boundary conditions, I'm calling nx for the x part, ny for the y part, and nz for the z part. ny pi y over ly sine of nz pi z over lz. That's your wave function for a single particle in a three-dimensional box. The general solution you get in separation of variables, as usual, has sine and cosine terms in it, but the boundary conditions not only fix our quantization, give us quantum numbers nx, ny, and nz, but also eliminate the cosine terms, just because the wave function must go to zero at points where the wave where the potential diverges to infinity. The quantization also sets the allowed energies of the system, and the energy of this state is given by h bar squared pi squared over 2m, and then we have a combination involving these quantum numbers, nx squared over lx squared plus ny squared over ly squared plus nz squared over lz squared. Now this looks like a sum of three things squared, and it's useful to make this look more like the magnitude of a vector in three dimensions. Essentially, I'm going to define this, I'm going to define a vector or a scalar quantity, for instance, k squared, a k vector, such that this overall energy here is equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m, looking like the kinetic energy of a particle with wave vector k, k being essentially 2 pi divided by the wavelength. The k vector that we're working with then is, for instance, given by kx is equal to pi nx over lx, Likewise, for ky equals pi ny over ly, and kz is equal to pi nz over lz, where the overall k squared is kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. If I make these definitions, the overall energy now starts to look like the squared magnitude of a vector in a three-dimensional space with three separate components, kx, ky, and kz. And this k space, three-dimensional space, is the space that you want to think about in terms of the quantum mechanical structure of many particles in a 3D box, which is, of course, where we're going with this. So what happens when we have many particles in a box? Well, we know we're working with fermions here, and fermions obey the Pauli exclusion principle which means we're not going to be able to put more than two fermions in exactly the same quantum state. So if I'm trying to occupy many, many, many states here, I'm going to need many states to be, well, I'm going to need to understand the structure of many states. So thinking about this in terms of the three-dimensional k vectors, say this is my kx direction, this is my ky direction, and this is my kz direction. The overall allowed values that I had for my energy were given by specific integers, essentially dividing these k axes up into specific points. kx was defined by pi nx over lx, for instance. So nx being 1, 2, 3, etc., like for our one-dimensional one particle in a box, I essentially have a set of ticks along my x-axis here, my kx axis, that tell me what the allowed values of kx are. Likewise, I have a set of allowed values for ky, and a set of allowed values for kz. And it's going to be hard for me to draw this out in three dimensions, but if you think about the allowed values where these things all intersect, when I have an allowed value of kx, an allowed value of ky, and an allowed value of kz, I have an intersection point there. That means I have an allowed quantum state here for nx is 1, ny is 1, and nz is 1. I, of course, also have an allowed quantum state out here, where nx is 2, ny is 1, and nz is 1. 
and I'm not doing a very good job drawing this, but you can see each intersection point here is associated with some cube between the intersection and the origin. And that cube signifies a certain volume. And the volumes in K-space are something that's very useful to think about. So this point now here would represent KY is 2, KZ is 1, KX is 1. Each of these points is associated with a cube. And the volume of this cube, which is going to become important when we start talking about trying to fill as many of these states as possible, is given by, well, the length of each of these sides. I'm talking about the volume in k-space now. This, of course, being associated with nx equals 1, this is pi divided by lx, is the length of this side in k-space. Likewise, this is going to be pi over lz. The y, of course, is going to be pi divided by ly. So if I wanted to know the volume of one of these cubes in k-space, it would be given by, sorry, I shouldn't write it as capital V, I'm using that symbol later. It's given by the product of these three quantities, pi, LX, pi over lx, pi over ly, and pi over lz. It's given by pi cubed over lx, ly, lz. This, of course, you recognize as pi cubed divided by the total volume of the material that I'm working with. So that's a useful expression to keep in the back of your mind. The allowed states that I have are the intersections where I know the value of kx, I know the value of ky, and I know the value of kz are all together one of the allowed values, or the allowed values for kx, ky, and kz. So that describes the structure of the states. They're spread throughout this octant, both positive kx, positive ky, and positive kz, at the specific values where I have known integer nx, integer ny, and integer nz. Now, what I'm working towards here is what happens if we put many electrons in this 3D box. And subject to the assumptions that these electrons are all going to occupy valid quantum states and that they're not going to interact with each other, but for the Pauli exclusion principle, we can think about what is the lowest energy state going to look like. Well, the energy, if you recall, was proportional to k squared. k squared acts like the radius. This is the total squared magnitude of the k vector associated with kx, ky, and kz in k space. So again, if I'm thinking about k space in terms of some kx, ky, and kz, if I want the lowest energy state for n electrons, I have to first fill the state that's very close to the origin. And I've got quite a few states that are very close to the origin here. If I'm working with n electrons in a realistic solid, n is going to be like 10 to the 23. So I'm going to have a lot of electrons. I'm going to fill a lot of these states. So when I look at it from the perspective of seeing all the states all filled, all as close to the origin as possible, since that's going to be the state with the lowest energy, essentially what I'm talking about is a, a quadrant here, a, um, essentially an octant of a sphere the volume, the, the maximum volume, filling the largest number of states with the smallest possible radius for all those states. So I'm essentially filling this volume out to a specific radius in k-space. So if I have n to the, 10 to the 23 sort of states here, essentially the radius here is very large relative to the separation of any, of any two states in k-space. As such, I don't need to worry too much about the fact that this isn't actually a sphere, that there's some jaggedness to the surface, and I'll still get a reasonably good approximation. As such, the total number of states that I need here, or that will be filled out to a certain radius, is going to be one-eighth times the volume of the overall sphere, for instance. So one-eighth to <laughs> pull just this quadrant, or octant, with positive kx, positive ky, and positive kz, times the volume of this sphere, 4 thirds pi kf cubed. And I'm using kf, that's a shortcut, or a shorthand that I'll describe shortly. And that's going to then be equal to the total number of states that I need to accommodate my 10 to the 23 electrons, or my n electrons. <clears throat> 
Now thanks to the fact that electrons are spin one-half fermions, I can construct the lowest energy spin state is the singlet state. We've discussed this. Essentially up, down, minus, down, up. And that allows me to put two electrons in that in each state without worrying about whether the state is symmetric or anti-symmetric under exchange, the spatial part of the wave function allows for two electrons since I can construct an anti-symmetric under exchange spin wave function, the singlet state. So the total number of electrons I have divided by two electrons per state is the total number of states that I would need, and the volume of each state, as discussed in a slide or two ago, was pi cubed divided by the total volume of my chunk of material. So, this is the volume in K space necessary per state. This is the total number of states necessary. That gives me the total volume in K space necessary to accommodate all of my particles. And then this just tells me the volume of this octant of a sphere in terms of the radius of the sphere, essentially. So, what this tells me, if you rearrange things a little bit, is that kf cubed is equal to 3 pi squared n divided by v, which tells me that kf, if I solve for it, is, well, 3 pi squared n divided by v to the 1 3rd power. This n divided by v thing I'm going to redefine as a lowercase n. Griffiths uses a Greek letter rho, and I don't really understand why. This n is the free or conduction electron density. The number of free electrons that we're considering per unit volume. Not to be confused with the n quantum numbers we had before, n sub x, n sub y, and n sub z, but you get the overall idea here. This is just geometry in K space, necessary to account for the total number of states necessary to, well, include all of the particles that we have to fit into this material. Knowing this k sub f, and I'll tell you the name of that, this is the, well, it's the Fermi k, we can calculate e sub f, the Fermi energy, named, of course, for Enrico Fermi, and e sub f is h bar squared kf squared divided by 2m, which if we substitute in the definition of kf here, which we just solved for, is h bar squared over 2m times 3 pi squared n to the 2 thirds power, since I'm squaring k sub f. So the Fermi energy now is a, prop is a property of the density of free electrons, Planck's constant, and the mass of the particles that we're working with. That tells us what the energy of the highest energy electrons in a material is going to have if these electrons are free to move around subject to the assumptions that we mentioned earlier. It doesn't tell us what the total energy of all of these electrons are, however. This is just sort of the maximum energy of a free electron in this metal. Some electrons have much, much lower energy, having quantum states that are much closer to zero energy, essentially, to the origin in k-space. So what is the total energy? The total energy is something that we can add up more or less as an integral. If I'm still thinking in k-space, kx, ky, and kz, if I think thin spherical shell in k-space at a, not doing a very good job drawing this, some thickness dk at some radius k, the volume of this thin spherical shell is what's going to tell me the number of electrons that appear at this particular distance from the origin in k-space, the number of states present at a particular energy, essentially. So the delta v here, associated with, I shouldn't call it delta v because we're talking volumes in k-space, not volumes in real space, but the volume in k-space that we're working with here is one-eighth as before, since we're working with just an octant of the overall sphere, times the surface area, 4 pi k squared, times dk, the thickness. Essentially, the surface area of this octant of the sphere times the thickness of that little slice. 
dE, then, the total amount of energy that's going to be contained within this, is going to be the number of states that fit within this, d, within this volume in k space. So the volume in k space, 1 eighth times 4 pi k squared dk, divided by the volume of each state, pi cubed divided by the overall volume of my chunk of material. This expression is the number of states within this volume, and the overall energy associated with that is just going to be the number of states times the energy of that state, h bar squared k squared over 2m. Now I've left out a factor of 2 here, since each of these states can actually support two electrons, thanks to spin. So this tells us what the overall dE is. If you do some algebra to simplify this out, h bar squared over 2m, and then I have a capital V, and I have a pi squared in the denominator, and then I have a k to the fourth power dk. That overall is our expression for dE. And that's just the dE that happens within this particular thin spherical shell. If I want to figure out what e total is, I have to calculate an integral dE going from, well, essentially no energy to the total energy to all the way up to the Fermi energy. If I express this instead of an integral over dE as an integral dK, well, I know what dE is in terms of dK, so I'm going from 0 to Kf, the Fermi k, the maximum radius in k space associated with an electron at this in this lowest energy state, and then h bar squared v over 2m pi squared k to the fourth power dk. You can do that integral hopefully, and the answer is h bar squared k to the fifth power, kf to the fifth power, divided by 10 pi squared m. If I substitute in the definition of kf, which we found in the previous slide, what you end up with is h bar squared 3 pi squared n to the 5 thirds power divided by 10 pi squared m, and then there's left over a v to the minus 2 thirds uh, overall. I had a v in the denominator in my expression for, e, for k sub f, and I had a v in the numerator here, and the partial cancellation is what gives me this v to the minus two-thirds power. So the total energy is inversely proportional to volume raised to the two-thirds power. If I allow the volume of this free electron gas to increase, the overall energy decreases, and that makes a certain amount of sense. If I'm giving them more space to occupy, it's going to behave essentially like an ideal gas. As an ideal gas expands, the energy decreases. The gas does work as it expands, for instance, if there's some pressure to the gas. And pressure, that's the key term here. The pressure, effectively, as a result of the change in the total energy as the volume changes, is called degeneracy pressure, since you're forcing these electrons into the same state. You're essentially forcing them to be degenerate. Um, exclusion, exclusion pressure would probably be a better name for this, since it's a result of the Pauli exclusion principle, the fact that we're not allowed to cram all of these fermions into the same quantum mechanical state. But pressure, at least in classical physics, is minus the derivative of the energy of the system with respect to the volume of the system. And now we're talking about the total energy of the quantum mechanical state, adding up the energies of all the particles altogether. And if you go and get the expression from the previous slide for the total energy, what you'll find if you take the derivative with respect to the volume is minus two-thirds, I'm sorry, we had that v to the minus two-thirds power, so while we have a minus sign from this, we're going to get another minus from the v to the minus two-thirds when we take the derivative of something to a negative power. So v to the minus two-thirds, then we have our constants, h bar squared, three pi squared, n, all to the five-thirds power, divided by 10 pi squared m, and our v, which was to the minus two-thirds power, is now to the minus five-thirds power. So again, I have an n to the five-thirds over v to the five-thirds. I can simplify that out and tell you that the pressure, minus a minus, giving me a plus, is equal to h bar squared, three pi squared to the five-thirds power, divided by 10 pi squared m times this density n, density of free electrons, 
to the 5 thirds power. So if I increase the density, I increase the pressure. If I decrease the density by letting the solid expand, I decrease the pressure. Uh, for example, just to put some numbers on this, for copper, the free electron density, N, is something like 10 to the 29th electrons per meter cubed. Very large number of free electrons in copper. It's an excellent conductor. Everything else in this is just physical constants, h bar, pi, and then m being the mass of the particle that we're considering, the free particles, in this case our electrons, so it's the mass of the electron. If you plug in the numbers, you'll find that the pressure under these circumstances is something like 10 to the 10th pascal. So this is actually quite a large pressure. The pressure of the atmosphere, the Earth's atmospheric pressure, is about 100,000 pascal. Well, this is a good five orders of magnitude higher than that. So this is a big number, but a big number is to be expected since we're talking about solids. Bulk modulus is essentially the measure of, or a measure of the resistance of a solid to changes in volume, and that's the same sort of quantity that we're talking about here. Bulk modulus, the bulk modulus of copper, is something that you'll calculate, or that you can calculate, given the same sort of analysis here, and it has the same order of magnitude. What you get just by assuming that the mechanical behavior of copper, essentially how much it resists if you try and squeeze it, the mechanical behavior of copper, as determined by this very simple assumption that it behaves nothing at all like a solid and entirely like a box full of electrons, is actually reasonably close. The properties of copper as a solid are, in part, determined by the behavior of the conduction electrons as a free electron gas. Now, there are a lot of assumptions that go into this, of course, and those assumptions aren't quite right. So the fact that you get something reasonably close to a realistic bulk modulus or a realistic pressure associated with the behavior of particles in a solid is perhaps the result of accidental cancellation of many independent errors. The likelihood of the nuclei to hold the solid together versus the repulsion of atomic electrons likely to push the solid apart, for instance. But at any rate, this behavior of a free electron gas does give us a reasonable picture for the behavior of, or for the behavior of solids. To check your understanding of this topic, derive an expression for the average energy of an electron in the ground state relative to the Fermi energy. Now, the average energy of an electron in the ground state, the ground state is that lowest energy state containing all n electrons, relative to the Fermi energy, which is the maximum energy of any electron in that lowest energy state. Second of all, just understanding the basic concepts, concepts of pressure, why was there a minus sign in the expression for the pressure in terms of a derivative of the, of the energy with respect to volume? And finally, since we're talking about pressures, let's compare the degeneracy pressure to the ideal gas pressure. Looking at it from the perspective of the ideal gas law, we have thermal pressure and degeneracy pressure, and we can compare them together. So that's about it for the free electron gas treatment of conduction electrons in metals. That's not the end of the story, of course. The behavior, quantum mechanical behavior of solids is a vast topic, but this is actually a reasonably comprehensible approach to understanding what happens for conduction electrons in copper, for instance.